All right, uh, participation seems to have leveled off at this point. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Trey Lorraines, the State Medicaid Director here at the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority. We want to welcome you to our first Sooner Select Dental Town Hall, dental town hall this year. Uh, I will kick it over to our CEO and uh, the Secretary of Health and Mental Health, uh, Kevin Corbett, for some introduction. Thank you, Trailer. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, today is a beginning of an important change in how we deliver dental care to more than a million Oklahomans receiving Sooner Care benefits. Um, let me share some statistics with you that I think are quite staggering. Um, one of them, according to the, the America's Health Rankings, Oklahoma ranks 43rd in the country for preventative dental health services for, for adults 18 to, and older, and only 50% or, or less of our adults on Medicaid have visited the dentist. I think we'd all agree that that's just not acceptable. Our new Medicaid delivery system, Sooner Select Dental, is an opportunity to continue to honor our vision here at the Healthcare Authority for all Oklahomans to be healthy and have access to quality healthcare services regardless of the ability to pay. Now, the development of this program has involved a great deal of collaboration, beginning with the vision that was created by Governor Stitt and the passion that each of our staff have here at the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority. It's also included health leaders from all over the state giving us their views in terms of what would be successful in changing the direction with regards to health outcomes in Oklahoma. We've also had a great collaboration with members of the Oklahoma legislature, including Senator Greg McCourtney and Representative Marcus McIntyre, who, le who led a, a legislative process this year uh, that was quite frankly tremendous. It provided us overwhelming support and approval to make the change to this new delivery system. And I wanna thank them personally for their leadership. You know, we'll continue to uh, collaborate with these partners to prioritize health care access and quality health outcomes for Sooner Care members, as we always have. It's our view that innovation is the key to success, and to be successful, we sometimes must be willing to try new ideas and be willing to change paradigms. I think it's our view that we'll settle for nothing less than making this a life-enhancing, and in some cases, for some of our members, life-saving initiatives. Um, I ask all of us to keep in mind as we move forward, regardless of our professions, who we work for, or what we believe is the best strategies, we all share the same end goal. And that is, we want to make Oklahoma a healthier place to live, and together we'll make that happen. So now I'd like to turn it back to Trailer Reigns, our state Medicaid director, to explain the Sooner Care Dental Program and the process that we'll take forward uh, as we move forward this new adventure. Trailer? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, before we get to that, I wanted to allow uh, our OHCA's dental director, Dr. Luce, uh, to uh, also give a few remarks as uh, we kick off today's session. Thank you, Trailer. I'm Dr. Karen Luce, the Oklahoma Health Care Authority Dental Director. And again, I welcome you all and thank you for joining us for our first Sooner Select Dental Town Hall. Uh, the Oklahoma Health Care Authority's mission statement expresses the importance of optimizing accessibility and quality health care and improving health outcomes for Oklahomans. When it comes to oral health, Oklahoma can do a lot better, however. The most recent oral health report card, which evaluated Oklahoma's oral health, rated Oklahoma a D. And did you know that less than 50% of all children ages 1 to 20 enrolled in Medicaid receive any type of preventive dental care. And 66% of all Oklahoma third graders have experienced tooth decay. One way of improving oral health outcomes is through an alternative delivery system. OCA's intent is to make this change in the delivery system a collaborative effort among stakeholders, including you, the providers. I'm going to go ahead and, and hand it back over to Trailer. Thank you, Trailer. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Luce. Uh, so uh, we have some prepared slides to kind of walk through uh, the vision and the goals for the program, but I just want to start by saying that uh, we don't want this to be a town hall experience where it's just OHCA staff talking to you or at you. Uh, it's meant to be interactive when we want to um, get mean meaningful thoughts and feedback from you. Um, you know, last year, you may remember, we did a series of town halls after we awarded our managed care partner contracts, and it was a way to introduce you to them. This year, we wanted to do it a little different before we even released the RFP. Um, so this is really meant to uh, be a time for you to share those concerns and make sure that we have uh, addressed them in the contracts as we move forward with the RFPs that we're going to put out later this fall. Uh, I will say that we will have a Q&A session towards the end. 
uh, where we will happy to take them live. But in between now and then, if you have a question that comes up, please direct them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, not the chat box. That allows us to kind of keep a record of that. And we'll we have folks that can either answer them live uh, during, during the session, or we can pull them out to answer after during the Q&A part. All right, so we can go ahead and start our official, the slide deck. Tiger, if you wanna start with slide one, next. All right, so we'll briefly go over kind of the key provisions. A lot of what you're gonna see is um, us highlighting the differences that are uh, updated this year, rather than what we did last year, based on uh, the provisions that came out of the law that Kevin mentioned in Senate Bill 1337. Next slide, please. So, of course, as Dr. Luce and, and Secretary Corbett have mentioned, our primary goals for moving towards this delivery system is, uh, number one and first and foremost, is to improve the health outcomes for our Oklahomans and our senior care members. Uh, we're going to do that by moving toward a value-based payment methodology and away from our typical um, historic way of paying providers, which is more based on volume uh, and a fee-for-service model. Uh, we want to improve senior care beneficiary satisfaction. Uh, of course, containing costs through improved care coordination uh, of services delivered to our members, uh, and really uh, focus on a way to increase cost predictability for the state through this new payment reform. Next slide. So program design. Uh, I will say as we go through these slides, they're going to be very specific to dental providers. Uh, as a reminder, we will be doing uh, three separate RFPs for the new delivery system. Uh, one will be specifically focused on dental services and dental providers. Uh, the other will be what we're calling our medical uh, RFP, which is inclusive of, of medical services, behavioral health, uh, pharmacy, vision, uh, basically everything other than our comprehensive dental services. Uh, the third RFP will be for what we are calling the Children's Specialty Program. That will be a comprehensive benefit, um, again, excluding dental for kids in the custody of child welfare services or juvenile justice services uh, and focused on their specific needs and intensity for care coordination. So the key design, program design for our dental providers, um, we have uh, what we're calling Oklahoma provider-led entities. So some key abbreviations that you're going to notice uh, throughout the RFPs as we release them and as we start getting more communications out is um, not typical MCO language or managed care organization. Uh, we, we will call our partners moving forward that uh, are awarded contracts after the RFP uh, award uh, is contracted entity because a contracted entity can be several types of uh, organizations. Um, one important option this year, uh, this go round will be uh, Oklahoma provider led entity. And so, or a dental benefit manager specific to, uh, to this program. So what is a provider led entity? So we had a lot of conversations during the 1337 talks and negotiations about the importance of leveraging provider voice and experience in this process, even down to the level of uh, having the potential for an HMO type uh, organization that is majority owned or majority uh, governed by actual providers in the community. So it's an opportunity for um, say a group of dentists to come together and partner with other organizations um, like a typical commercial plan, maybe to provide those back office functions like care coordination and claims processing, all the things that um, that come along with running a health insurance plan, uh, but really allowing that local voice and that in-state uh, provider knowledge uh, in, in driving those operational decisions. So Senate Bill 1337 requires the healthcare authority to award several types of entities, at least three statewide contracts. So we will have, uh, again, there's a, we know the importance of having a statewide um, coverage for any of these health plans, um, just to ensure continuity of care, of course, as well as the other reasons that we're all familiar with. Um, the one exception to that is we understand that some of these provider-led entities may not be as mature in their development as a typical commercial plan. Uh, and we want to recognize that. And so we understand that there may be some that will only be ready to serve an urban area. So we would allow uh, an urban contract, an urban meaning Oklahoma City or Tulsa in those contiguous counties, um, to let a, a provider-led entity to operate in those areas. Uh, real important to that, though, is that we would require a five-year runway for that PLE to demonstrate that they can achieve statewideness. 
So that would be part of the evaluation process in this initial RFP go round to say, hey, we recognize you want an urban area now, but we're going to need to see a really strong uh, timeline with milestones that are achievable within that five-year period to reach uh, statewideness. Next slide, please. So what are our expectations for our contracted NEs? I know that a lot of our providers appreciate the, um, the great administrative uh, progress that the healthcare authority has achieved over the last 15 to 20 years and ensuring that our uh, providers are paid timely. Um, you know, we, we pay uh, every week after a clean claim is submitted and we know that's important to our providers and Sooner Care can actually be the lifeblood to a lot of these practices and we wanna recognize that for our contract identity partners moving forward. Um, you know, in the last, when we did this last year, actually a lot of our managed care partners paid even quicker than the healthcare authority does currently. Um, but we want that to in no way uh, be beyond 14 days uh, post submission of a clean claim. We also know that timely response and prior authorizations are important. And so we, uh, in addition to that being kind of built into 1337 uh, protections and language, uh, that will also go into our RFP. Uh, and if you were um, involved at all in looking at the RFP last year, you know that we had very specific metrics for turnaround regarding routine services, emergency services, uh, making sure that you, you get those authorizations timely so you can provide those services to our senior care members uh, timely as well. We will also have very specific quality metrics related to improved health outcomes, and we will use those to measure and monitor for compliance those contracted entities moving forward. So we're in the process right now of doing a lot of um, data analytics and really uh, getting good benchmark on our base data to know exactly where we stand currently with all these metrics um, and where we would expect our plans to be with regard to those same metrics uh, over the next five years. Now we recognize that in year one and two, you're not gonna see immediate changes in health outcomes. And so some of those quality metrics will be related to more access standards or hours of operation or timely payments and things of that nature. Um, and it's more of a, a gradual evolution getting to those uh, outcome standards. We also have an expectation that once it goes live, that all of our plans would submit all of their health data to our statewide health information exchange platform uh, that we do expect um, on a separate timeline to go live uh, sometime next year. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about who is and who is not going into Sooner Select. Next slide. So long story short, and I'll go through the next slides um, in detail, um, but you know we have a lot of populations we covered, but they can basically be boiled down into a few different buckets, in my opinion. You know, we have our age-blind disabled, um, we have our expansion, we have our kiddos, pregnant moms, parent caretakers. Um, so our age-blind disabled population, as well as our home and community-based served uh, population, are not going into Sooner Select at this time. So that leaves our kiddos, uh, whether you are in uh, traditional Sooner Care or CHIP, our deemed newborns or pregnant women, our parent caretaker relatives, which is those parents or caretakers of a Sooner Care member below about 37% of our federal poverty limit. Um, our expansion adults, uh, as of uh, recently, we have hit the 330,000 mark that will go into the uh, Sooner Select whenever we transition. Children in foster care, former foster care kids up to 25 years of age, kids involved in the juvenile justice system, and those uh, children receiving adoption assistance uh, through child welfare services. Uh, it's important to note that our American Indian Alaska Native members will have the option to opt in to Sooner Select. There will not be a mandatory enrollment uh, requirement, um, which is different from the other covered populations. We will give them the option to opt in. Next slide, please. So again, the excluded individuals are generally classified as our ABDs, but that also includes our dual eligible members. These are our members that are served by both Medicare and Medicaid. Our ABDs um, are individuals enrolled in a Medicare savings program. Members that are being served in a nursing facility or an ICF IID level of care. Members that uh, may be on Sooner Care during a period of presumptive eligibility uh, would not be in Sooner Select. Uh, also, those members that have Sooner Care eligibility by way of uh, have, have needing tuberculosis-related services. 
Next slide. Uh, our BCC members that are receiving treatment for medically necessary services related to a diagnosis of breast or cervical cancer. Those members enrolled in a home and community-based waiver services program like Advantage or the DDS waiver. Our undocumented folks that are needing emergency services only in accordance with federal law. Uh, the insurer Oklahoma employee-sponsored insurance dependent children uh, that are served under Title 21. Uh, which also makes me think of our, we have our employer sponsored insurance uh, that is covered, uh, that is actually a subsidy program where we pay the part of the premiums and co pays for those uh, members getting private coverage through the ESI program will also not be in Sooner Select. We also have our soon to be Sooners program, which is those pregnant moms who are relating, uh, who are eligible to receive pregnancy only benefits will also be excluded from the Sooner Select population. Next slide, please. All right, covered benefits. You know, this is gonna be fairly straightforward. So if the healthcare authority covers a dental benefit today, those services will be required to be provided uh, by our dental benefit managers moving forward. Uh, as you, most of you all should know, we added our, um, we call it our limited benefit, but it's a pretty expansive benefit for our uh, adult population. Uh, in addition to our already pretty robust children's benefit, uh, will all be required to be provided uh, by the dental benefit managers. Uh, there will also be requirements, very robust requirements for our dental benefit managers to work with the uh, contracted entities that are tasked with managing the uh, medical um, managed care program uh, to make sure that they have access to non-emergency transportation, um, if there is, for example, an emergency extraction needed in like a hospital or an outpatient hospital basis that will be covered through the medical plan. And so we will require um, very deep care coordination uh, and, and transitional services between the two covered entity types. Next slide, please. All right, just in addition to what I just said, the real great opportunity here and moving forward with a new man managed care delivery system is that there is an opportunity for the, the, the contracted entities to provide additional services that honestly, we're just not able to provide. A lot of times and a lot of ways, a fee-for-service Medicaid agency is kind of hamstrung by our federal regulations and what we can and cannot provide. So right now, as, as I'm sure you're aware, we can reimburse for those medically necessary treatment services. Um, we can't do those kind of outside of the box things, like how do we incentivize a member to go to their dental provider? Um, how do we, if non-emergency transportation isn't available, for example, how can we get a gift card for transportation? That's something that um, we've seen in the past and that we expect to see proposed in the RSD's RFPs as what are considered value added services. Some things I think we can expect to see are healthy rewards programs. Um, I, I've seen things like you go into the website and you fill out questionnaires, you do health risk screenings, uh, you complete certain um, online quizzes that really are addressing your, your overall health and your health outcomes. And they have a way of incentivizing for you. I saw plans where they even give you an Apple Watch to track your, um, you know, your heartbeat and all that stuff, just as a way to say, if you do these things and take uh, ownership and initiatives in your own health, you'll be rewarded. Um, we also saw things and expect to see, a, a, you know, expansion of teledentistry in ways that maybe we haven't yet. Um, and, you know, we mentioned expanded benefits for pregnant women over the age of 21. Maybe there are services that we cover, we don't cover in our limited adult benefit that we would recognize as still being very beneficial, not only to mom's health, but uh, baby's health uh, in utero. Um, and we, we expect to see things like that as a value added coming forward from this. And again, we, we are gonna require that coordinated service and integration um, and family-centered care, uh, not only from our dental benefit managers, but also in working with those medical contracted entities as well. Next slide, please. So members, uh, we say members are assigned, but members will actually have a choice between contracted entities and a dental contracted ben uh, benefit manager. Uh, they will be able to go into mysoonercare.org when they do their eligibility updates or if they're new to applying for sooner care. And at that point, um, they will actually have a choice among the various contracted entities for both their dental benefit and their, their comprehensive medical benefit. 
Um, if our members have questions about that or aren't quite ready to make a choice at that point, they can call our, our member services hotline and they'll be directed to a choice counseling agent who can kind of talk through the various value adds. Again, each is gonna have the core set of benefits that all of them across the board are gonna provide. Some may have different value adds that are maybe more important to a family than another one that's offered. Uh, so we'll be able to talk them through that. Um, really important here to note is that this is an OHCA function. It's not a managed care contracted entity function. And so there will be no direct member outreach or marketing from a contracted entity in order to get their business. That will come through us so we can be that independent arbiter and navigator uh, of which plan is chosen by the member. So those dentist prescribed covered outpatient drugs are reimbursed by the medical contracted entity. Uh, the preferred drug list will still be managed by the healthcare authority. Uh, we will still participate in all of our drug rebate programs, which are really important to us in terms of revenue. Uh, and those will also continue to accrue to the benefit of the healthcare authority. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, those medically necessary emergency dental services are, will be reimbursed through the medical contracted entity and not the dental benefit manager. Next slide, please. Network adequacy. Next slide. So of course, we know this is of utmost importance, especially uh, with our dental providers, is ensuring that no matter where in the state our members live, whether it be in the frontier areas and our panhandle or in an urban centric area, that they have access to the same quality care, whether it be our dental services or any type of medical or specialty services. So we will have very specific standards regarding time and distance for those providers. Um, and what that looks like is we will have geo mapping to monitor compliance of this to say that wherever our members live, we will expect us dental providers to be within a certain either driving time or driving distance of where those members live in that community. Uh, it'll be up to our dental benefit managers that if we don't currently have that type of access that meets those, um, those fairly high standards, it'll be up to them to do what they need to to incentivize providers to to meet those standards. So whether that's a uh, various types of reimbursements or incentives, things that we can't do currently, because as you know, we reimburse some of our fee schedule and that's all the flexibility the healthcare authority has. Our dental benefit managers and contracted entities will have those additional flexibilities to get creative in how they deliver those services. Uh, also important here is that prior to going live, those contracted entities will have to demonstrate to us and we will have to demonstrate to our federal partner CMS that uh, we have met and all of our plans have met those network um, and access standards moving forward uh, before we can even go live. Uh, you know, we may reach a situation and we'll, we, will, we are prepared to deal with that. Well, let's say we're getting close to go live and there's, only, there's one plan out of however many we choose overall that's not ready and they haven't demonstrated network adequacy. Um, we can have a situation where that plan doesn't move forward and they have to hold back until uh, next re-enrollment cycle or uh, plan enrollment cycle before they can go forward. Uh, so all these plans understand the importance of being ready for go live and making sure they've done what it takes on their part to get an adequate network across the state. Next slide. All right, super important to this is quality and population health. Next slide. So not only will it be an RFP requirement, but it's also a federal requirement of all managed care entities and um, prepaid ambulatory health plans, is that there will be an annual independent external quality review of the quality, timeliness, and access to services. Uh, Healthcare Authority actually went through the process last year of competitively bidding and awarding a contract to a vendor to provide those EQRO services as well as our QIO services. So we are prepared to start, um, you know, kind of had to put a pause on that work last year, uh, but we're prepared to kind of get that ramped back up and get those folks uh, ready to start this process as we uh, work towards implementation post-award. We'll also have ongoing comprehensive quality assessment and performance improvement programs. Um, also important here is the use of consumer assessment of healthcare providers and system surveys, our CAP surveys which really is focused at um, gauging from our members, how are we doing? How are our plans doing? Uh, how, how satisfied are they with uh, the services they received at the provider level, from the managed care level, uh, and the healthcare authority as well. 
Uh, in addition, we will have performance improvement plans required three annually for each of our dental benefit managers and medical contracted entities. And what that looks like is it's going to be it could be a combination of um, healthcare authority priorities. Let's say we know there's a certain area that we want our plans to focus on, and we can require a performance improvement project or plan for the health uh, plan for that year. Uh, but we also want to allow them space to be innovative and space to maybe say, hey, a performance improvement plan may look different in southeast Oklahoma than it does in northwest Oklahoma and give them the flexibility to focus where focus needs to be made across the state and those various outcome measures. Next slide. One major difference from last year, and it's actually a requirement of 1337, which was a great outcome uh, from, the, from the legislation, was that we will have a quality advisory committee to the healthcare authority. Uh, so this committee will have the power and duty to recommend quality measures to be used by the contracted entities. Uh, those members will be appointed by the healthcare authority and the representation is of providers, uh, you know, representatives from hospitals and integrated health systems. Uh, members of the healthcare community, uh, members that receive services from these providers, uh, members of the academic community with subject matter expertise. Uh, we've already begun working with uh, provider trade groups, provider associations to start soliciting input from members of this com uh, committee. Um, it's very important that, um, you know, we recognize that OHCA staff are not the experts on everything and that the expertise more often than not lives outside of our four walls. And we wanna recognize that. And we want input from all the provider types um, throughout our health system to be able to provide input and in what those quality measures are. So we know that we're getting, it's a real Oklahoma-based product uh, using Oklahoma providers. Next slide. Financial. Next slide, please. All right, so as I'm sure you know, the, the main thread of moving towards um, a thread, not threat, of moving towards a managed care uh, delivery system is that we're using fully risk-based CAPA data contracts that will be approved by our federal partners. So what this means is the uh, per member per month relationship will be between the healthcare authority and the health plan. And then the health plan will enter into contracts with uh, you, the providers, uh, for the services that you provide. And then they will have flexibility um, that can be negotiated between the provider and the plan on how reimbursement will work. Um, but the, the payments between the healthcare authority and the plans will be that per member per month. Uh, it'll be actuarially sound, capitated payments. Um, we actually have engaged a consultant to begin the work with us right now, utilizing our claims data that is known to us uh, to really calculate what those PMPMs are for the various populations going into Sooner Select. Um, there will be uh, withhold agreements uh, in the RFP. So that looks like um, instead of either doing a bonus payment for good behavior or good outcomes recognized, which is something we will do, but separate from that is going into a capitated arrangement, we will withhold certain amounts of money um, going into the contract and, and we will tell the, the dental benefit managers and the contract identities once you perform A, B, and C, or meet metrics A, B, and C, we will give you the dollars that we withheld. So it's kind of that extra, kind of a hybrid carrot stick approach um, and going down that road. Next slide. Payment rates and timelines. Um, so very important uh, for that we make sure that our providers are protected going into managed care. We know that there's a generalized fear that um, a managed care entity or a dental benefit manager may want to come in day one and want to increase prop their profits. Uh, we know there's a fear that you know, you know, ways to do that includes uh, immediately reducing provider reimbursement or immediately uh, raising the requirements for prior authorization that inevitably reduces service utilization. So. Certain protections were built into 1337 and will go into the RFPs. Um, one of those is uh, provider rates and making sure that they're, they're reasonable. So a way to do that is rate floors have been established uh, that will be in effect for providers until July 1st of 2026. So whatever the rates are that the healthcare authority is paying the day before we implement managed care will be the rates that are required to be paid by our partners for the first two years of implementation. 
Uh, our goal with this, of course, is to eventually get to value-based payment contracting between our contracted entities and our providers, but we know that takes time. We know that uh, our provider community is not used to a value-based uh, contracting solution at this point yet. We know that this will give you time to research what that is, uh, talk to your associations, try to get assistance in negotiating those rates, uh, and working with uh, contracted entities after award to arrive at a solution that works for um, for you and the contract identity, as well as the member. So we will still have protections for those uh, payment methodologies that are prescribed and required by federal law. So like our federally qualified health centers, our rural healthcare centers, pharmacies, Indian healthcare providers, as well as emergency services. Uh, there will be no pay there will be no change to those reimbursement methodologies or the as those are protected by federal law. Next slide. All right, timeline. When do we when do we prepare to go live? So, as I mentioned, we will have three RFPs. Uh, we expect to release all of those early fall of this year. Uh, it's required by the legislation that the healthcare authority implement uh, sooner select and go live by October of 2023, pending CMS approval. Now we understand that's a very aggressive timeline. Um, I don't know, depending on you know. We all know time is quickly in October of 2023 is going to be here before you know it. Uh, we've already begun uh, work around the RFPs. Again, we had a great dress rehearsal last year and RFP development and even implementation. So we kind of we have a lot of lessons learned. We saw pitfalls that we ran into last year that we can correct course on this year. Um, so I really, truly believe we're going to have the best product possible as we go forward. Um, but we also understand that everything we do with regard to sooner select implementation has to be approved by our federal partners and that takes time um, so every contract we enter into every rate we set all of our readiness review activities and reports that all has to go to cms for review um, so there's a good chance that october 2023 won't be the actual go live date but we we're, we're going to do everything possible uh, at the state level to ensure that we've exercised good faith to get us there next slide please all right, so I know that was a lot of information and I have a tendency to talk fast. So I will kick it back to Melissa and her team to kind of field questions if we have any, or maybe some of you have already entered some in the Q&A. Thank you, Trailer. we appreciate that. Um, as Trailer said, my name is Melissa, I'm the Chief of Communications here at OHCA. Thank you to everyone who is joining us for this presentation. A couple of notes, if you have a question that you would like to ask one of our pa panelists live, please raise your hand and I will call on you. We will also unmute your mic at that time so that you can ask your question. If you feel more comfortable putting your question in the Q&A box, we do have staff available to answer your question there. I am gonna go ahead and pull one of those questions from the Q&A box to get us started so that others can start formulating their questions to ask. The first one is, have the time and distance rates been set yet, or standards, I should say? Uh, yes, I will say that we went through a pretty robust process during RFP development last year, and we utilized uh, not only internal resources, but external uh, consultants as well. And we have set those. Um, I'm not sure exactly, I don't, I'm not remembering exactly what they are, and I might ask another team member to step up if they do remember, um, but they have been set, uh, and we expect to move those forward into the RFP this year. Now, what I can say is we, we might be able to share those, Sandra, I'm looking at the Sandra Pueblo, our Deputy Medicaid Director, she may or may not be familiar with those dental time and distance standards. Um, I am looking up, I'm looking them up for you, Trailer. Okay. So we might come back to that one once we have them. Um, and that's a great question. I would love to kind of hear your thoughts on those and whether they're reasonable. I, I also see, while we're waiting on Sandra to get back on that one, uh, I do see an open question in the Q&A box. Uh, am I correct in understanding that the fee-for-service model is not the goal? OHCA will pay the dental benefit manager's capitation and the DBM can choose to pay providers how they choose. But the fee-for-service model is the floor for the first two years. After that, it could be a capitation. Um, some yes, some no. So you're correct in that we're trying to get away from volume-based payments and the typical fee-for-service model. Um, but you're gonna have to remember there's, there's two different kind of relationships here. There's a relationship with the healthcare authority as a payer and the end receiver of the reimbursement. 
So it's our goal to have more cost predictability in how we pay a dental benefit manager. So we will pay a capitation to the DBM. And then for the first two years, you're right, it's going to be more fee for service uh, with a floor, um, not being any lower reimbursement than what you receive the day before we go live. Um, but the payment is, may even vary from dental benefit manager to dental benefit manager. And it could also vary from the dental, dental benefit manager to each of the providers in their panels. Um, and I would say it's not gonna be a one-way decision. This is going to be something that's gonna be a negotiation between the provider and the dental benefit manager for what works best for that practice, that population base. Um, we know not all of our providers um, operate in the same ways. Um, and so we want to allow them that flexibility. We do not en envision um, a situation where a dental benefit manager is paying a capitation now, it could be like a medical home model where it's partial cap, partial fee for service, but really value-based payments can look a lot of different ways, uh, but we want that to be a decision made between the dental benefit manager and the provider themselves. Trailer, I have an answer for you. Awesome. Um, currently, for the um, primary care dentist, for the urban distance is set at 20 miles. And the rural distance is at 60 miles. Um, for the specialist, um, the urban distance is within 25 miles of the dental health plan and rural lease residents. And for the rural distance for specialist is uh, within 60 miles. Thank you, Sandra. I'm curious if there's any, any initial impressions on that or feedback or around reasonableness. And again, I want this to be just as much your meeting and as it is ours. Uh, this is your chance as we are building out the RFP. They're not final. Um, you know, I, if you looked at it last year, it's about the same length. It's close to 500 pages. There's a lot of information that we wanted to get covered, a lot of protections, uh, and a lot of expectations of these dental benefit managers moving forward. Um, so I would say chances are, as I've had these conversations with folks that come forward with questions, chances are it's been addressed, but we don't want to miss anything. So if it's a concern to you, it's more than likely a concern to others. We would love to hear your feedback. There's a comment or a question. That distance would be better than many current members have. That is a good goal, in my opinion. Good. It's great to hear. Yeah, honestly, I wish we could get to a lot of these on our own, uh, but the standards that we are setting for our contracted entities moving forward are in a lot of ways higher than what we're able to achieve as a as the healthcare authority currently. What would happen if an office sees patients outside of a distance range? Um, you could still, if someone, a member can always choose where they see their provider and the provider that they want to receive services. So this was this is not meant to be a, a hard set radius that you can only see patients within that radius. Um, it's more of a standard of network adequacy. So if a member chooses to see you um, or go to a particular practice and they're 100 miles away, but that's the member's choice, um, they can definitely continue to do that. Have there been any tentative DBM contracts being awarded as of now? No, they have not. So, um, you know, I would expect some of the same bidders for both the medical and dental contracted entities that came forward last year to bid again. Um, I would also expect new market entrants this time, especially if we have provider groups that want to come forward. Nothing has been awarded tentatively, unofficially, nothing like that. We haven't even released the RFPs yet. Um, so, I would say probably getting close to 30 days prior to RFP launch, um, we will probably start going into what we're calling a blackout period where we won't talk about the RFP anymore. Um, we won't engage any vendor, potential vendor discussions or folks that may be interested in bidding um, just to have those protections in place. How many DBM contracts will there be? Um, so federally, we have to have at least two. Uh, I will say that some, you know, Last year we had three and part of the rationale with that was we understand that things come up and some of these contractors may not wanna to continue to do business for whatever reason. 
and will drop out. And it's important to still have enough so that we have that mandatory uh, requirement of two statewide. So we'll do at least two, maybe three. Um, we'll take a very intentional look at this because we don't want to allow too many because the, the market's saturated and becomes financially, financially not viable for plans if they don't have a certain amount of members in their membership. Um, so I would say probably no more than three, but we'll, we'll evaluate that as we go down the road. Trailer, as we wait for more questions to come in, I do want to let our participants know that a recording of this town hall meeting will be available by Friday on the same web page on our website where you register for the town hall. So you can look for that. You know, also while we're waiting, I failed to mention earlier, as we talked about PLEs um, and recognizing again, the importance of the, the provider voice and really ownership in this process, there will be preferential scoring for our provider-led entities that are applying. Um, now, what we've been saying is that it's a preference, but not a pass. And so a provider-led entity would still have to meet all of those requirements of um, a non-PLE contracted entity, like HMO licensure, or having the right credentials through the insurance department to practice in the state, reserve and capital requirements, all the things that we went through earlier in terms of claims processing turnaround and PA turnaround. Um, but let's say assuming a provider-led entity and a commercial plan met all of those other things, the PLE would score higher than the commercial plan, just given the fact that they're a PLE, if everything else was the same. Um, so a, a, an important distinction as we move forward between those two types of contracted entities. Uh, question around, will there be coverage frequency changes? You might have to expound on that. What I will say is, I believe if benefits update, that will be something that happens on an annual basis as we, um, as we do go through enrollment periods, much like commercial plans on the health insurance market today. Um, I think that's maybe what you're asking, but if not, please feel free to expand. You're a quiet group and you're going way too easy on me. Happy to answer any questions you have. There's no wrong, no wrong questions. All righty. Well, seeing that there's no more Q&A, uh, again, this isn't your, your last opportunity. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. But if at any time, um, you know, like uh, Melissa said, there will be a recording so you can share with your, your colleagues or your peers. And if there's any questions, I think we will have forums available for input through our website. Um, keep up with our website and our banners, and we'll be putting more, uh, more information out there to come. All right, Dr. Thank Luce, you. I want to wrap, close this out. Thank you so much, Trailer, and again, uh, Secretary Corbett, for being here with us today. And thank you, all of you, for your questions. And as Trailer alluded to, we will have a second town hall in Oklahoma City. This will be hybrid. It will be at the Metro Tech Center on South Bryant, and it will be a week from today on June the 20th. Sorry, we're in July, July the 26th at 6 p.m. So we encourage you to enjoy to join this uh, town hall as well, our second town hall, uh, if you do have further questions. And you can register for that at our website at oklahoma.gov backslash OHCA. We at OHCA wish you all an amazing day. Thank you so much. <laughs>